It would be very difficult to summarize uh, with any justice the career of Melanie Phillips. Uh, she's the author of nearly a dozen books. Uh, she's, she's a novelist, she's a playwright, but her, her chief standing is as a columnist of international reach and of uh, acknowledged fearlessness. I won't go any further into that, but first of all, I will say directly to your face, thank you very much uh, for agreeing to do this, and I do appreciate your time. Not at all. Thank you very much for having me, Rex. Nice to meet you virtually. Uh, let's start on something that may seem foolish, uh, but it, it leads into other things. In the last little while over on this side of the crazy waters, we've had two really ridiculous episodes. We had the great international toy company, Hasbro, deciding to neuter, don't laugh, Mr. Potato Head. They wanted to take the Mr. off uh, so that they could make Mr. Potato Head gender fluid. Uh, this is, it, it was such, such a crazy thing. And then we have another episode where a children's book that has been on the world's bestseller lists for 30, 40, 50 years is suddenly uh, accused of having the, the original taint of racism and Dr. Seuss is now on the way out uh, of various libraries and things. You wrote a book whose title most greatly appeals to me, The World Upside Down. How is it that a 21st century society can be wrestling with such idiotic problems? It is extraordinary, isn't it? And yes. uh, what's so extraordinary is that so much of this seems so unbelievably stupid. You wonder how anybody could be quite so absurd um, and ridiculous. But it's actually not absurd and ridiculous um, once you realize that the world really has been turned upside down in that the people who are basically uh, in control of our cultural life dictate the cultural agenda um, are determined to turn right and wrong, truth and lies, victim and victimizer on their heads. And this is because they have basically taken a wrecking ball, an axe, if you like, a metaphorical axe over the last really half century yeah. to the building blocks of Western culture and Western civilization. Um, and not only are they seeking to rewrite um, British, American, Western history, on the basis that the West was kind of born in sin, born in racist sin. Um, but they are actually uh, immune uh, from any argument based on factual evidence um, because they have disdained the whole notion of objective truth. It doesn't matter anymore. It doesn't exist. The only truth that matters is what's true to them. It's what they can write or say or believe that is constructed in their own image of how they want the world to be. And they are refashioning our past, the past of all of us, yeah. in the image of what they want the world to be. And this is quite evil, actually. And, you know, here is a children's book you mentioned, a series of children's books by Do uh, Dr. Seuss. Um, and we can all think of other examples, uh, some of them trivial and some of them rather important. But, you know, we are basically watching the destruction of our past, the rewriting of our history, in order to overturn the basic tenets of our civilization. Yeah, it is. Again, I'll, I'll pick the more remarkable uh, and easy examples, but it, as you say, it, it goes down deep and it is very wide. During the so-called Black Lives Matter uprisings last year, uh, you had attacks on the statue of Abraham Lincoln. And by extension, I hear there was some guard put on a statue of Winston Churchill. Now, no one would claim anybody has Christ's perfection. But when the society turns against it's truly heroic and virtuous figures. What's the impulse behind this? And why do people yield so easily to this radical pressure? Well, that's really the, the issue. Um, you know, a madness has taken hold of a whole swathe of people on the left for perfectly understandable reasons once you look at what happened to the universities going back to the 60s and 70s. Yeah. This desire to, uh, in the words of uh, the revolutionaries themselves, the cultural revolutionaries, it was a cultural revolution, and they embarked on what was called the long march through the institutions in order to overturn 
the tenets of society from within. So they would penetrate the universities and the schools, the law, uh, the churches, uh, the civil service, um, all the institutions of the West in order to do this. Now, when you look at the universities, take just one example, because that's where some of the most terrible examples of obvious examples are taking yeah. place where we can see what's taking place. What's so striking is not the fact that there are these um, hundreds or thousands of students who believe all this nonsense, this madness, but that they, what they are doing is being facilitated by the people who run the universities, the principals, the vice chancellors, the lecturers, some of them actually taking part in these things. But even if they're not taking part, even if they're not personally signed up to this ideological point of view, they stand back because they're frightened um, or because um, they just want a quiet life or whatever. But it's what's called, it's, it's what's been called in the past, uh, it's a French phrase, la trahison des clercs, the treason yeah. of the clerical class, the treason of the intellectuals, the treason of the administrative class. Because this madness can only take place because people in authority are allowing it to take place. What they should be doing is saying to these students, you're out, you're out. You know, we're not having it anymore, but they won't do that because why are they not doing that? It's not entirely clear to me. Part of it is because they yeah. are frightened uh, of violence, maybe. P part of it is because they feel that they can't go against the kind of cultural orthodoxy which comes at them from in your country, you know, CNN, MSNBC, and the New York yeah. Times, Washington Post, all that stuff. And this kind of controls the narrative because heaven forbid, you know, they should be pilloried in these organs. And I can tell you as someone who has been pilloried for many decades, yes, it's so not aware. very nice. And worse than that, people are indeed, indeed in danger of losing their jobs. So I don't for a moment uh, uh, pretend that this is an easy thing to do, but basically this is being connived at by an entire administrative class. I, I, I thoroughly agree with your analysis. And I've also uh, watched uh, over the years if you were back in the 90s, the phrase political correctness, for example, uh, was to some minds a debatable thing. There were some academics who claimed that there was no such thing. We went from there, I think, over the 10 or 15 years since then, that the tenets uh, or the, the main lines of thought of a certain section of opinion became the only opinions. And in a, in a curious inversion, the hard secular left has set up a system of dogmas from which A, it is either impolite or almost illegal to dissent. And secondly, if you stumble into that dissent, uh, you can be punished It's the so-called cancel culture. And finally, just picking up, especially on your point about universities. I don't know what they were like a hundred years ago, but I, 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 I certainly hope that the idea of thought, of exploration, of contest within reasonable means, and above all, uh, an aspiration for truth and beauty was what kept them going. But now they're factories for approved thought, or so it seems to me. Yeah, well, there was a very distinguished uh, and brilliant uh, British philosopher called Sir Roger Scruton, uh, who yes. wrote some magnificent books. You may well have yes, known about him. Um, and he himself became the victim of this terrible uh, um, uh, 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 inquisition. Um, he gave an interview to a left-wing magazine, cut a long story short. Uh, somebody at that magazine gave, uh, put out an entirely distorted and false uh, 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 impression of what he'd said and painted him as a terrible racist and all the rest of it. But it was a lie. His words had been taken completely out of context. Now, eventually, the truth was discovered, and uh, um, he, uh, his name, as it were, was cleared, but not before. And get this, we have a conservative government. We've had a conservative government in Britain for some years. And the conservative government, uh, uh, which had put him, Sir Roger Scruton, onto a, an architectural commission, took yeah. him off on the basis that they believed that he was this terrible guy. Eventually, as I say, uh, the truth was out. He got reinstated. He never actually recovered from this. Um, but uh, that's the kind of thing that has been uh, uh, going on. Um, and, you know, uh, it's a terrible thing. Now, Roger Scruton was a man who 
uh, in previous years, fought a very courageous battle behind the Iron Curtain. He went into uh, Soviet countries, I think it was uh, Czechoslovakia, maybe in Hungary, I can't quite remember, one of those countries. And he did what he did to empower and encourage dissidents. So he knew better than anybody what totalitarianism was. And he became in such despair, he was a professor of philosophy, and he was effectively forced out of his academic positions years ago in Britain, because he had uh, views which fell foul of these orthodoxies. Such was his despair towards the end of his life, he died last year, such yeah. was his despair over what we're talking about, what had happened to the universities, that he came to the conclusion, he said this, he thought the universities should be shut down or at the very least, their humanities departments should be shut down. Yeah. And they should only remain as universities insofar as they would have, keep open their uh, science uh, uh, departments, scientific departments. Because he believed, and he was a philosopher, he came from the humanities. Um, he, more than anybody, he understood what the humanities meant and how important they were. And he believed that now the humanities have become an area in the university sector which was promulgating lies and hatred. Um, and distortions and propaganda and totalitarian thinking and shutting down all reasonable and rational thought. And so he came to the conclusion that it was the, the, the game was up. You couldn't rescue the humanities. And so they had to be shut down. What a terrible thing to have happened. And well, you know, in his own I, life, it was a kind of paradigm of what he was in such despair about. Well, he's certainly a, a, a far better mind than mine, but he coincides in that judgment. Uh, I was aware of it. He coincides in that judgment with the words of uh, uh, Dr. S Dr. Peterson, uh, who also, uh, apart from health considerations, just by the storm uh, that his presence and his opposition uh, to the conventional dogmas of the day uh, certainly wore him down. I want to just one more time on this one point only, and then I'd move on to other areas. Ours, meaning the West in general, uh, is a magnificent society with all the flaws that it has had and has. Uh, its achievements in terms of science are, I think, miraculous. Uh, even during this COVID, the facts that we have pharmacies and scientists and laboratories that can do what they can do. And then there's the legacy of, of intellect, both, both scientific and humanistic. Uh, the advance of progress, the extirpation of what we will call extreme poverty, systems of justice, institutions. So we have this thing, and within the Western society, there are so many who seem to think that this is one of the darker corners of hell, and it has to be disowned. And those who are now the possessors uh, of the legacy should apologize for being there. Uh, do you at all accord with that, that read? Well, it's a bit like, I mean, I've oft, often made a comparison uh, with, you know, Lewis Carroll's Alice Through the Looking Glass. We've all gone through the looking glass or possibly in Alice in Wonderland, we've, you know, but between the two books, we've gone through the looking glass and down the rabbit hole. Um, <laughs> it's, um, it's, it is mad. Um, it is a mad situation. Uh, and um, it's very difficult to cope with because, you know, um, you're up against people, as I said before, who are immune to reason, they're immune to evidence. The only thing that keeps me going, and it's kept me going for years, is that um, there are literally millions and millions of people out there, both in, in Britain and America and in other Western countries which are going through this, um, who think like us, who actually understand the difference between truth and lies, who actually do follow the evidence where it leads, as I always try to do. Um, who, are, who, are, who, who don't live in the world of ideological fantasy, but live in the world of here and now. Um, and uh, from time to time, you know, they are making their voices heard with some, some political effect. Um, but the fact that, you know, our societies are being run by uh, an elite of people who are yeah. so detached from reality uh, doesn't, shouldn't blind us to the fact that, you know, they don't speak for the vast majority of ordinary, middle-of-the-road, sensible decent people. However, um, the people who run the culture are very powerful. Um, and 
they have a great deal of uh, power to undermine it. And I do believe it is being very, very badly undermined. It's very hard to see, for example, if you look at education, if you look at the destruction of the traditional family, I mean, these are the two yeah. absolute building blocks of a civilization, family and education. You know, uh, you, you, you build health, emotionally healthy individuals to carry your culture through to the next generation. You teach them through your education system about their culture so they can transmit it. You can transmit it down through the generations. And that's how you keep going. That's how the culture perpetuates itself. Now, both of those institutions, the family and the education, system have been wrecked and not only have they been wrecked but we've now got to the situation where we're like what two three four five generations on since this thing started this, this whole movement started so to a large extent we've kind of lost the uh, ability to of, of so many people to actually yeah. understand what has been lost you know so many of our teachers have no idea what they might or could or should be teaching. They have, they, they themselves were taught so very badly and, yeah. and have been left in such ignorance. And so it is nevertheless a great comfort to me to see that there are still millions of people who do think properly. Yeah. And so that gives me hope that eventually, um, you know, this thing can be turned around in, in some way. I'd like to pick up on that point. How, how deep and, and embedded is the disjunction, the cleavage, between, I suppose I can see how I say it, between what I would call sane and normal people who have some contact with this earth, it's not a, a concept spun fantasy, and what you call it incorrectly, the clerisy, the intellectual class, the business class, the academic class, the journalistic class, that seem to have bought into this. I mean, two of the great disturbances politically of our time, in your case, it would have been Brexit, uh, showed that division most sharply. And in the States, uh, it was electro electric in sense. Trump was the most unlikely vessel of a kind of resistance uh, to these implanted ideas. But I wonder, when, when we see such things as six foot two former males triumphing in a women's race against a five foot four, how many of the people who are not speaking and who are not in universities and are not in journalism are saying to themselves, you know, boys, this is just bad. The title of your own book, The World is Upside Down. Uh, is that cleavage so deep that it threatens the, I don't know, the, the, the structure of our social system itself? Well, I think it certainly does. I mean, what we've been doing for the last several decades is basically unraveling what it is to be a human being. Um, uh, you know, we're now denying biology um, and not just rewriting history, but denying biology. Um, and in my view, uh, doing a very great deal of damage to very vulnerable children, needy children who yeah. are psychologically confused. I'm talking about the whole trans agenda, which in my view um, is a kind of, well, not just a kind of, it is institutionalized child abuse that's going on under the guise of therapy. Uh, which is quite evil. Um, now, I believe that in certain areas such as that, I think the public revulsion is so deep and so great and so widespread that I think that over, t over a, a reasonably short period of time, that particular madness is going to basically be overturned. Um, but I think it's much more difficult to do so with, for example, the rewriting of history. Uh, because yeah. people can't get at that very easily. You know, this is kind of behind cl the closed doors, as it were, of the university lecture hall. Um, and it's, it's much more difficult. I mean, education used to be called uh, a, the secret garden because it was so difficult to get inside yeah. the, the uh, dynamic of the teacher and the pupil or student. Um, and so there are certain things that are much more difficult than others to, 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 to change. And then there's the whole political system. I mean, I'm looking at what's, you know, what's, go what's happened in America. Um, and I mean, put aside whatever one thought about Donald Trump. Um, I mean, the people that President Biden is appointing to his administration yeah. are people who, um, even in their wildest dreams, the far left in Britain, uh, could never have imagined that such people would be put into power because they are the people who represent the most hard left agenda, which is yeah. fundamentally anti-West, anti-nation. And it's going to do America an enormous amount of damage. And I'm afraid it's already wrecking America as, um, 
as what we all re re require America to be, which is which is the the the, the great uh, uh, standard bearer uh, of uh, uh, Western freedom and defender of Western freedom in, in the world. And now the enemies of Western freedom, the enemies of freedom everywhere, are looking at America and laughing in contempt. I mean, they they can't believe their luck. These tyrants everywhere. No. Uh, because they see America is now weak. So that worries me enormously. Uh, but again, that's something that will come to a head, one way or the other. Um, I fear it's not going to be very pretty and it's going to be very, very dangerous for all of us, but it will come to a head. But what we're talking about, which is the kind of cultural transformation yeah. that has been going on for decades, that is very difficult to reverse. And, you know, people who are call themselves conservatives, I mean, in Britain, we call, you know, we have a conservative party. In America, you have the Republican Party. Yeah. They're basically people who purport to be conservatives. Well, in my view, both in America and in Britain, for the last several decades, they have not been conserving what they need to be conserving because they are, they've forgotten what it is they need to conserve. They've been mesmerized by this long march of the left through the institutions. And they uh, become so demoralized, they kind of lost sight of what it is that they should be conserving and protecting, yeah. uh, especially since the fall of the Soviet Union, where they believed that you know, their fox had been shot. It hadn't been shot. It had become, it had, it had, it had basically changed its shape you know, from a fox into you know, a wolf in sheep's clothing, to mix yeah. my animal metaphor <laughs> quite horribly. Uh, but you know what I mean. So, and, and it's the same in, in, in Britain. You know, you've got a Conservative Party, which is which has basically imbibed uh, left-wing thinking without realizing what it's been imbibing, without realizing what it's been surrendering. So, somehow, we all have to find politically a way back to yeah. what I would call real conservatism, small C conservatism, which we start again to conserve, like environmentalists should be. We, are, we should be conserving the social and political and cultural ecology of the West before it disappears. And that's what we have to, that's, that's, that's the task. Without that, it, it's all over. We have to find a way of defending our culture and we have to yeah. use, we, ha we have to re reinvigorate um, revitalize uh, conservatism to do so. You've had a uh, long, distinguished, and in some cases embattled career in, in this particular trade, this journalism. And uh, Guardian Angels uh, is, is a very good account of that, uh, one of your many books. Uh, as I was watching some of the stuff last year in America, by television, obviously, or internet, when I saw that was one again one episode that had a certain talismanic value for me, it was a picture of a great building about thirty or forty feet high at least, completely uh, wrapped in burning flames at night, and in front of it was a CNN reporter reporting. I, I think it was uh, Portland. It could have been Baltimore, reporting that the demonstration tonight was mostly peaceful. The reason I give the anecdote is that it, it, it really vividly illustrates that this trade of journalism, which at least at one point uh, thought its fixation with getting fact and truth was its only justification and the resistance to the so-called conventional ideas was part of its writ, is now complicit in, in sometimes so, so explicitly linked to the dogmas and doctrines, you talk global warming, you could talk racism, you could talk transgenderism. In the great newsrooms of the world, these topics are either off limits, or if you don't subscribe, someone will hound you out. Where, where, why has journalism walked into this pit? Yes, I mean, I, I observed with some horror uh, what the Washington Post did when Donald Trump became president. It put on its masthead, democracy dies in darkness. And I thought how absolutely correct that is. Democracy was about to die in darkness and the darkness was the Washington Post. Um, and I watched this process happen in Britain. Now, it hasn't taken the extreme form that I believe it's taken in America. Um, I mean, I've watched in the last four years with disbelief how uh, partisan the American media was, how it ignored the scandals of the, the attempt to uh, basically leave her out of office an elected president on the basis of smears, politically uh, motivated yeah. smears, um, and how uh, partisan it was um, uh, in not reporting this um, and in telling lies basically the whole time. Um, and it's still doing the same thing, but in reverse. Uh, 
Now, we haven't got that quite that in Britain, but we oh. do have a very, uh, uh, um, uh, um, a media that lost the plot a long time ago. And I can almost tell you almost the year in which I saw this happen. Um, it, it was in the 80s. And uh, in the 80s, I was still working for The Guardian. I worked for The Guardian uh, for about 20 years. Now, you may know The Guardian is, you know, it's a bit like The New York Times, um, uh, uh, but it's, it's m more so. It's the kind of journalistic equivalent of a university in the sense that it is the center of left-wing thinking in Britain. Um, and I worked there about 20 years and, you know, uh, I, I, I changed my views while I was there, <laughs> largely as a result of being there. <laughs> Um, but I remember in the 80s, or possibly it was the 90s, but um, I can't quite remember the date, but I remember um, uh, it was during uh, the Bosnian War, um, and I remember a particular journalist won a lot of awards for her reporting, and she, it was absolutely brilliant reporting. It was, it was sort of reporting which made you sit up and go, wow, that, you know, it's, she, she brought the whole thing to life, mm -hmm. and it was all a lie. Uh, she was describing things that she hadn't seen. She wasn't there. She made it up. And at The Guardian, even, there was a discussion about this. And the discussion said, the people in this discussion went, is it right that we should be putting stuff into the paper that's like, not true? Mm -hmm. And the answer was, oh, it's fine, because it's the broader truth. In other words, we all know that the villains in that particular yeah. set of wars uh, were the Serbs. And we all know that the victims were the Muslims. And so it doesn't matter whether what we describe, we didn't actually see. Because as long as we tell a story which has the people who should be the victims being the victims, and the people who should be the villains being the villains, that's fine. But it was, it was lies. Um, and I watched this happen at the BBC as well. It was called um, the journalism of attachment. And the thinking behind it, and I remember sitting through these discussions in absolute disbelief. The, 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 the discussion went as follows. We were all taught as we were mm -hmm. that we had to be objective. We had to aim for object objectivity and fairness and balance. And we had to put our prejudices to one side and we had to tell two sides of the story. Allegation had to be met with defense. Um, always there were two sides of a story when you were reporting the facts. That's how we were all trained. And along came this ideology which said, this is dishonest. Why? Because none of us can be objective. Why? Because all of us have prejudices. Well, of course, all of us have prejudices, but you know, uh, we can all try to be objective. We were trained to be objective. You can actually put your prejudices to one side uh, with goodwill and good faith and good training. But that went out, the, out of the window. We had to be honest to the fact that we were prejudiced. And consequently, we had to tell lies because that was honest. <laughs> now, this sounds mad. It is mad. But yeah. that was the logic that was followed. And essentially, it came back to what we've just been talking about. Journalism didn't invent this out of nowhere. Most journalists, certainly in the quality press, uh, the, you know, the highbrow uh, educated press, um, journalists are highly educated. They come from the universities. They've been educated in the universities. And this is what they were being taught in the universities. There is no such thing as yeah. objective truth. The very idea there is objective truth is a lie. All stuff is a matter of opinion. Um, you say this is true. No, that's just your opinion. My opinion is as good as your opinion. My values are as good as your values. My culture is as good as your culture. There cannot be a hierarchy of anything. It cannot be a hierarchy of values, of culture, and of truth over lies. It sounds mad. It is completely crazy. But that's what was coming out of the universities with the, with the results we can all see. But it took that form in yeah. journalism, which has been carried now to destruction. I'll just go to two more areas. I don't want to steal too much of your time, but one in particular, <clears throat> we're still into the politics. And this is, this is a part now of journalism, although it's not official journalism. One of <clears throat> the most remarkable things of the last three or four months in American politics, the most remarkable thing actually, was when Facebook decided to knock the New York Post off uh, and Twitter off its feed because the Post was carrying a, a documented story <clears throat> about Hunter Biden and his laptop and his dealings with foreign countries in China. And <clears throat> Silicon Valley started to exercise its muscle and simply wiped out accounts 
Black, uh, I think Twitter kept the post uh, offline for 13 or 14 days. Most of the big American news networks also walked away from the story. <laughs> Excuse me for coughing. The combination of the great technical resources of Silicon Valley in harness with the major information systems deciding what information gets out. Uh, I don't think I've seen anything quite as potentially perilous in all of this stuff as that. What's your view of it? If you're talking about the grip of big tech um, uh, and, and all that, it is terrifying um, because quite clearly, you know, it's all about power without accountability. That's, you know, it is that uh, with, with, with knobs on because it's, it is so powerful because it's, you know, these, these, this handful of, of giants, media giants control so much and yeah. control so much that, you know, interferes in, in our lives. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think there has, is already a, a bit of a backlash, maybe a significant backlash uh, from the public against, against Facebook. Um, uh, uh, and there's certainly uh, um, some early warnings from various governments that they want to get into, you know, regulating the net. And we'll have to see uh, where that goes. I mean, I'm in, I'm in two minds because it's a very difficult situation if you have uh, uh, regulation of the media. It's a very tricky area mm -hmm. because um, it becomes immediately censorship, whichever way you like to cut it. Uh, so it's a kind of choice between, you know, having Facebook censor everything, Facebook and Google, or having people censor Facebook and Google. I mean, <laughs> this is... I'll put it mildly, yeah. not a pleasant situation uh, to be in. And honestly, I just don't see how this is going to end unless we have a, a kind of mass revolt by the public uh, against all this, which is possible. The trouble is that we all use this so much. I mean, you know, Amazon, uh, people depend on Amazon. I mean, for goodness sake, in, in this pandemic, Amazon has been a kind of lifeline for people uh, doing their shopping on, on, online. Yeah. Um, so it is extremely difficult to see how this is going to be uh, how this is going to be uh, addressed. Um, but uh, I do believe in the sort of dynamic of action and reaction. I think you know when things get out of hand, there is a reaction, okay. uh, and that takes us into a different kind of place. It may not be a better place, but it will be a different kind of place. Uh, <clears throat> I'm just going to impose a, a, a last topic. There are so many things that you have written about in so many books, but uh, <clears throat> I want to end on. <clears throat> The one that I think, seen from a certain perspective, is by far the largest issue in the world because it involves all the world. And, and its proponents, at least, uh, tell us that it also involves the threat of the destruction of the world and the planet. I'm speaking of the religiosity issue of global warming. Global warming is one of those dogmas or doctrines that we've been talking about by implication all throughout this in which at the present time it's acceptable to be strongly on the fight against climate change as it's called but to inquire into the methodology to ask for the full statement of, res of research that's behind it to allow counter voices of authority uh, of scientific knowledge to speak out that's also been pushed so far but here we have a set of people hard left again telling us we must redesign <clears throat> the industrial economy of the entire planet under this particular thesis, but in main or established media to give it serious question is to put yourself in the position of, I quote the word, denier, or in most cases, you don't get on at all. What do you think of the science of global warming and how mm -hmm. far has politics wandered in, into the laboratory and taken over the instruments? Well, uh, I happen to be somebody who, when global man-made global warming was first invented as a theory in 1988, I immediately denounced it as a scam and a hoax um, and anti-science, and I have not changed my view ever since. And as a result, I've been on the receiving end, as you may imagine, of yes. some fairly ripe insults, not least because I'm not a scientist. But you don't have to be a scientist to see fraud and to see uh, rubbish thinking and a complete lack of logic. Um, and uh, it was once described as post-science by a, by a man-made global warming acolyte, a, a very senior academic who described it as post-science. 
um, that post-science means that you, instead of looking at the world and arriving at a conclusion, you start with the conclusion and then you fit <laughs> the evidence to fit. Um, in other words, it's an intellectual fraud. Now, this is a big subject and we don't have time to go into no. it, but all my researches ever since have confirmed me in the view that, um, first of all, there is no objectively res respectable evidence to suggest that what is happening now is anything um, out of the ordinary uh, of what the normal fluctuations in climate temperature, which have gone back since time immemorial. Uh, the second thing is that so many, if not most of the, um, or much of the science is based on forecasting. Um, you know, if we carry on in this way, then in N years, the seas mm -hmm. will rise, the planet will fry, and so on. Now, this is all produced by computer modeling. And I was very impressed years and years ago by being told that there was no computer model that could ever accommodate the unprecedented complexity of climate. Mm -hmm. Climate is something which is, inf is not influenced by so many things, but gives rise to so many feedback mechanisms that it's simply impossible to program a computer to take account of all of that. So the computer modeling model, if you like, is intrinsically flawed. And then you have the fact that people feed into the computer model what they want to feed in and they get out, therefore, what they want to get out. So that is fundamentally flawed. Then you have the added uh, aspect that because this thing became the orthodoxy so many years ago, if you are in a climate related field mm -hmm. of science, you don't get a grant from the relevant grant making bodies unless you can show that your research will uphold this theory. If it's going to deny the theory, then you don't get the money. Now that is quite an incentive to keep this going, uh, regardless of the facts. And then you have, I'm afraid, some actual frauds where uh, a number of scientists have simply falsified the evidence. They have omitted data, they have uh, not compared like with like, uh, they have fiddled with um, the, uh, the baselines of their calculations or whatever. Mm -hmm. Now, all this, um, and then you look at the actual evidence, you know, you think of you know, the famous polar bears, you know, yes. years and years ago, we were all supposed to be petrified about, you know, the plight of the polar bears, the ice was melting, the polar bears were dying. And, you know, people were distraught about the fact that the polar bears were becoming extinct. And, you know, the polar bears are doing very, very well. They went you know, from 8,000 to 30,000. They're actually increasing. Yes. Um, and stuff like that, you know, when you start looking at it, the whole thing is a pack of cards. It falls apart. But if you say that, yes. if you're a scientist, you don't work. You lose your job. You don't get grant funding. Um, and if you are a journalist, you don't get published. And if you are a journalist for the BBC, or forget the journalist yeah. of the BBC, you know that some years ago, I've forgotten how many, if just a few years ago, the BBC issued an edict. This is a, the BBC, the world's premier objective ho-ho yeah. broadcasting organization, the mm. most influential in the world. And it issued an edict that there was now no question that global man-made global warming wasn't happening. And therefore, there was no need to have anybody on the air anybody on any broadcast show or item about man-made global warming who put the op op alternative point of view. Yeah. You have a journalistic organization which says only one point of view is now going to be broadcast. I mean, what on earth are we living through here? And everybody goes, they're just nod along and say, oh, yes, yes, yes. Um, and it's very hard to get these views put across as a result. Um, but nevertheless, uh, I think what's happening is disastrous, not just because of the actual issue itself, uh, not just because um, we can see that uh, 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 countries and states in your country uh, are, are adjusting uh, their behavior to the ruin or ruination of their economies and people's uh, lifestyles. I mean, people are paying huge amounts. People who are poor are being forced to pay huge amounts for their 
for heating their homes. Yeah. They can't afford it uh, because of this environmental agenda. In, I was watching what happened in Texas in this uh, terrible yes. uh, snowstorm uh, where you know, it was highly contested, but it seemed to me quite obvious. You know, Texas's uh, power supply is fed by a number of different types of power. Uh, both fossil fuel and uh, re renewables, wind power. But the crucial thing was the failure of wind power, which, uh, you know, in a, in a complex chain of power supply, um, it was the thing that actually, you know, finished it off. Um, now, you can't even say that without being basically, you know, yeah exiled from civilized society. <laughs> so it, this is to me, you know, it's green totalitarianism. Um, wow. And the final thing I would say is that when in, in my researches on this subject, um, it was absolutely obvious to me that this whole environmental agenda comes out of something that went underground with the Nazis. Um, it comes out of the, uh, uh, the idea that uh, what's wrong with the, with, with the world, world is there are too many people. Um, and, you know, you have this whole business of population control, uh, which went underground un after the Nazis for obvious reasons. Um, and then it came out as environmentalism, um, which sounded so much better and you know, entirely respectable. Yeah. But it is basically about, uh, it's basically, uh, it's, it's founded upon a view which says the only thing that's wrong with the planet is the human race. Um, and therefore the human race has to be put back in its box. And people have got to basically go back to a kind of medieval way of living in order to save the planet. I mean, this is completely crazy, well, um, but has been, again, we were talking about it earlier. It's, it's not the people who are promulgating this doctrine who are the problem. It's the people who go along with the yeah. promulgation of the doctrine, our presidents and prime ministers and, and politicians who just nod along and have committed their countries to completely ruinous policies yeah. on the basis of a madness. And I mean, this is, you know, if, if anything exemplifies uh, the retreat from reason and the retreat from science uh, that's been taking place in the last several decades. This is it. Well, it looks I couldn't, uh, all, all of that, I could not agree more. Uh, we've been saying, uh, using your title a lot, at least I have during this, this broadcast, The World Upside Down, that's another final illustration. But if there's any hope that The World Upside Down can be flipped back uh, to its rightful posture, it's because people like you are writing and thinking and talking. And I thank you very much for the time that you have given me. Not at all, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much.